So it's my great pleasure to introduce Kyle McDonald, um, who's our next speaker. And um, it's, I'm particularly interested in this because Kyle kind of demonstrates something we were just talking about in the policy discussion, which is how artists can influence technology. Um, so Kyle will tell a lot more about his, his work, but let me just read a short, short bio. So Kyle crafts interactive installations, sneaky interventions, playful websites, workshops, and toolkits for other artists working with code. Exploring possibilities of new technology to understand how they affect society, to misuse them, and to build alternative futures. Aiming to share laughs, spark curiosity, create confusion, um, and share spaces with magical vibes. Kyle McDonald. <laughs> Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Kyle McDonald, and I'm an artist from Los Angeles near the LA River, and I work with code. I know most people think of artists like this. Uh, for me, art takes a lot of different shapes. Sometimes it means building these mind-bending, immersive installations with disco balls and structured light from computer vision, uh, tracking rare oceanic lights with Polynesian voyagers, using the most sensitive low-light cameras on the planet, or organizing group therapy for artists affected by the NFT bubble, or working with AI from sound design to interaction design, from robotics to dance. And today, I want to focus on this last thing about AI. And the majority of artists working with AI right now are making new kinds of images, mostly. Uh, but I'm interested in asking questions and building intu intuition through unusual experiences. I want to share some of those experiences with you today. Um, but before I do, I want to provide a little context. I know we've been talking about AI for two days now, but uh, I still want to give my version of like where this came from and what changed recently. What do we even mean when we say AI or machine learning? So artificial intelligence has a complex history that can be traced back to both the military and to early computational theorists. Arguably today, it means something like automation of non-physical labor. Machine learning is one approach to building artificial intelligence, and deep learning is a kind of machine learning that uses neural networks. If I want to automate something with a computer, sometimes I can just write a simple program that will explain kind of how to do it. I'll explain how to do it step by step with instructions. You know, we call that code. And machine learning is a little different because you program with examples of what you want to happen instead of providing instructions. So I like to say machine learning is just programming with examples, not instructions. And deep learning is the version of machine learning that has taken off in the last, let's say, 10 years or so. It's powered by two basic ingredients. There are these really simple functions called neurons that are chained together, uh, one after another in big groups. Um, and there's an algorithm called backpropagation that tunes those neuron functions until they match some data that you've given them. And this approach to training neural networks was invented a while ago, in 1970. But it was popularized by this researcher, Jeff Hinton, in 1986. And he was basically shunned by academia and conferences and journals for decades because no one thought neural networks would ever be useful. Um, but then in the 2000s, there were these big changes that brought neural nets into the mainstream. And researchers like Jeff Hinton literally conspired to rebrand neural networks as deep learning. Like, they sat down and they made that decision together. Uh, and then the changes that kind of allowed that to flourish were sort of threefold. So there was the data, the algorithms, and the hardware. Um, the rise of social media and surveillance capitalism meant that companies like Google and Facebook had access to way more data than ever before. And deep learning was the only way to really effectively put it to use. So the algorithms evolved as well, even in really fundamental ways. Um, you know, they added simple functions to the output of those neurons, or they would randomly multiply neurons by zero uh, during training and like kind of make it hard for the network to learn. And it turned out that made it more robust in what it learned. Um, 
And these small changes had huge impacts on the efficiency and the accuracy of the learning. Uh, and then in terms of hardware, in the late 2000s, researchers started using graphics cards, which are also called uh, graphics processing units, or GPUs, to train their networks. And the speed difference was so big that it meant they could train more complex networks for longer and get more accurate results from the data. So there was this moment that kind of caught everyone's attention in 2012. Uh, in the machine learning research community, where this really small team of researchers won this ImageNet challenge using neural networks for the first time. So the task of this challenge was to predict the name of an object in a photo from 1,000 different possibilities. You know, if it's a photo of a leopard, you want to say it's a leopard and not a jaguar or a cheetah. Uh, and after years of older machine learning algorithms being applied to this problem, uh, this new team suddenly won by a landslide with an error rate that was half of their competitors. Uh, and guess who co-authored that paper? It was Jeffrey Hinton. <laughs> he finally got his revenge. Uh, one of the most important ingredients in their solution and in all of the image-based work up to the present is something called convolution. And so convolution means finding the overlap between a chunk of data and a sliding filter, which is called a kernel. Uh, this is an example of a one-dimensional con convolution. So uh, in this case, the blue line is our data, and the red kernel is kind of sliding across it. And then the yellow overlapping area creates this black line, which is the output of the convolution. Um, this is just a moving weighted average where the kernel is describing these weights. And you can do this in two dimensions as well with images. So uh, this means finding the overlap between like the pixels of a small kernel and a big input image. Um, and depending on the pixels in the kernel, the output could be a blurred version of the input or a version where the edges are highlighted or something else. So another way to think about this is that the output will highlight things in the image that look like the kernel. So if the kernel is a horizontal line, then the output will highlight horizontal lines. And when convolutions are used inside neural networks, they're called convolutional neural networks. <laughs> convolutional nets apply different convolutions, one after another, uh, in multiple layers. And they're simultaneously learning basically two things. One is image patches that help discern categories and what combinations of these patches make up a category. A category is something like leopard. Um, First, the network learns to detect things like uh, edges and spots, and then a combination of like an edge and a spot might make like an eyebrow and an eye. Um, and then finally, the net will recognize that when you've got an eyebrow and an eye and a nose, that that must mean it's a face. Uh, and sometimes it's hard to untangle exactly what's going on behind the scenes inside these networks. Uh, you know, what is a feature and what's a combination of features. Um, but if you want to understand this better, there's this great video um, from Jason Yoshinsky uh, where he walks through, like, basically what's going on inside a convolutional network that's looking at images. What are they seeing? In retrospect, it really shouldn't be so surprising that these networks would succeed because uh, they were already in use in the late 90s for automatically reading handwritten digits on checks and mail. Um, and Recent developments in generative imagery are also based on these convolutions. So it's not just the category prediction, kind of image classification stuff. Uh, these complex filters on an image um, can downsample it to a category, but they can also be upsampled kind of from a category. You can take a category and kind of make an image out of it and filter it until you get to uh, something that looks like what you asked for. Uh, these image generators didn't appear overnight, though. So some of the first hints were back in June of 2015. Um, has anyone seen this picture before? Okay. Wow. Okay, that's interesting. So this, this was a kind of psychedelic technique called deep dream. Uh, the idea is to basically take what a classifier sees, a uh, classification network sees, and then make small adjustments to the image to increase the probability of it seeing that thing. So if a classifier sees a dog in like this region of the picture, then it will modify the pixels a little bit to make it more dog-like. If it sees like, uh, you know, some kind of building, it'll make it look more building-like. And after enough iterations, we're left with this monstrosity. <laughs> uh, this was the first Deep Dream image that kind of went viral, and it was leaked by someone at Google to uh, Reddit. <laughs> and uh, I actually just learned yesterday 
even though this is colloquially known as the puppy slug, um, I learned that this was uh, saved in a file called trippysquirrel7.jpg. <laughs> Deep Dream is incredibly beautiful from a theoretical perspective because it's one of the first techniques to really show us what was happening inside a convolutional network. Using Deep Dream to visualize specific objects like uh, lifting weights, um, it becomes really clear that the network hasn't learned how to separate the object from the context of the hand that's lifting it. And besides showing us what was happening inside a network, we can also think of this as one of the first text-to-image generators. Another popular direction around that time was the style transfer technique, which was announced in August of 2015. Helena Seren is an artist who mixes style transfer with her own drawings and paintings. And both Deep Dream and style transfer are not really machine learning algorithms per se, uh, but they, they both use a trained neural network that has come to understand uh, how image classification works. They use that to augment images. Uh, pix to pix was another algorithm around that time, 2017, um, that operates on a completely different principle. So it takes image pairs and it learns how to convert from one image type to another Im image type using a convolutional network. And new versions of this technique are still used today for you know, neural photo filtering and all other kinds of applications. Um, oh. <laughs> So before Deep Dream or Style Transfer, uh, there, was <laughs> there was this algorithm called CharRNN by Andre Karpathy in May 2015. And it was in some sense, it was like the first chat GPT. He basically trained a small language model, not a large language model, a small language model on Wikipedia, and it would generate text like, uh, you know, naturalism and decision for the majority of Arab countries capitalized was grounded by the Irish language by John Clare, an imperial Japanese revolt. So it, it was really surprising to see this at the time, even though it's completely nonsensical, because it still felt a little bit like reading Wikipedia. Uh, and he trained it on code too, and it would generate you know, arcane comments that came from the Linux source code and everything. It would you know, say the kernel blank will coeld it to user space. And I don't, if you know how to write code, like this is weirdly reasonable, <laughs> even if it doesn't make sense. <laughs> um, so this wasn't the first generative text. You know, there's a lot of earlier examples of generative text and poetry and even you know, physical machines that generated text, uh, but it was a kind of breakthrough in complexity where these were, I think, the first hints that something big was about to happen. Um, and there were artists like Ross Goodwin who was doing deep experimentation with these algorithms from day one. Uh, so Andre, in the last slide, who made Char RNN, he actually finished his PhD right after publishing that, and then he joined OpenAI, which had just been founded, and then four years later they announced GPT-2. And if people weren't paying attention before, they were once GPT-2 was released. The results were kind of scary good for the first time. And the main point I wanted to make just from sharing some of this history was that artists have been quite early to a lot of these technical breakthroughs that have diffused more broadly into culture in the last couple years. Um, and this tech isn't, I don't think this is going away, uh, but the path ahead will always be all of ours to discover and to figure out where we want it to go. And a part of our job as creative people is to help define it, uh, whether that means imagining a future with it or pushing back against it. So I wanna take a kind of pointillistic approach and speak about a bunch of AI-powered projects that I've worked on, and I'm gonna roughly group them into three categories. There's the AI tech no one talks about, a uh, quick case study on face analysis, and what questions does AI help us ask? For me, uh, there's another idea that's a lot more exciting than generators, like image generators, text generators, and it's about automating similarity. Machine learning doesn't need to answer a specific question necessarily. You don't have to determine what category an image is or uh, you know, what the sentiment of a Yelp review is. Uh, we, we don't have to do those things. It can do, they, machine learning can do a lot of other things, like it can provide a softer, more intuitive analysis. This is a screenshot from an algorithm called UMAP, which is running on a data set of handwritten digits called MNIST. And UMAP will basically take a big data set and lay out every data point in space so that similar points are really close together and dissimilar points are farther apart. In this case, the 
data set of handwritten digits is a collection of really tiny images, 28 by 28 pixels per image, which is 784 numbers. And you map, one way you can think of it is that it reduces those 784 dimensions, all those pixels, to two dimensions, like a point in a 2D space. Um, algorithms like UMAP are called dimensionality reduction algorithms for that reason. And UMAP can suggest a shape to a data set that sometimes is hard to see from just kind of scrolling through the individual data points and looking at them, or even other types of visualization. UMAP can give you a lot of insight into kind of what the vibe of the data set is. For example, if we use you know, tiny images of fashion items, then all the high heels form a cluster at the bottom right uh, with the boots at the top left. I don't know if I can, you know, these are the boots up here. These are the high heels down here. And they're kind of related to each other and blend and blur into each other. The first time I explored dimensionality reduction was in the context of short drum samples. And I was thinking about new ways to explore large sound data sets for composition and improvisation. So I converted a bunch of samples into tiny images called spectrograms, and then I organized them using dimensionality reduction. Welcome. Oh. Oh, hello. 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 Dimensionality reduction doesn't give you a single definitive answer. There are a lot of different ways to organize a data set. It's more of a starting point for other kinds of exploratory analysis. And I showed this experiment to a friend, Alexander Chen, who just moved to the countryside in New England, and he was turning into a bird watcher. So he asked, what would happen if we tried to do dimensionality reduction on bird sounds and bird calls? And we can snap these spectrograms to a grid to navigate them more easily. <laughs> that same machine learning technique I used for the sounds can also be applied to other media like images. So there's this researcher in Japan, Itsuo Sakane, who has spent decades documenting media arts events around the world. And he has this unparalleled collection of hundreds of hours of video that have just recently been digitized. Uh, so I worked with this Japanese art studio, Rhizomatics, and we extracted high-level features from the videos using a neural network that was trained to classify them, but we took kind of the internal state of the neural network, not the classification. So we didn't ask, you know, what is this object, and then grouped it by what the objects are. We took the kind of thing that the network was thinking about what the object was uh, before it gave us the answer, and we used that to kind of uh, organize them by similarity. So abstract concepts like green background or blue sky, circular objects, eye shapes, feathery textures, they each get kind of grouped together in their own little cluster. Um, laying out images or sounds in a big collection isn't always helpful, so sometimes when machine learning provides a similarity metric, another approach to working with that is to build a search tool. Uh, and I worked with the Studio for Creative Inquiry at Carnegie Mellon, and we built a like, search by similar image tool for satellite imagery, uh, which is designed to help the public find patterns of interest in uh, democratized geospatial intelligence. And it's really ideal for locating infrastructure that isn't usually indicated on maps. For example, when you click on uh, you know, a container yard, then it will show you all the other container yards. Or when you click on you know, a pier, it will show you all the other piers. Or it works just the same for cul-de-sacs and sand traps and power lines and tennis courts. And as humans, you know, when we see something remarkable, we make a mark on the map. But for the neural network, Everything's remarkable. <laughs>
I've explored this kind of machine learning powered similarity approach in the context of humpback whale songs most recently with a composer, Annie Lewandowski. Humpbacks have this really complex uh, cultural um, musical repertoire uh, that has a kind of hierarchical structure to the songs, uh, really similar to classical music. And it can take hours of listening to humpback songs until you can start to internalize that structure and how it works. So we built a tool for analyzing humpback songs and running dimensionality reduction in a way that makes the structure a little easier to hear without listening to hours of music. So that, then we convert this visualization to lighting design in the context of a large installation that draws attention to all of the kind of dangers that are faced by ocean life, which is mainly uh, leftover fishing gear. Let's do a quick case study. I want to speak about face analysis briefly because it's the domain that I've spent the most time engaged with in my art practice that's connected to machine learning and computer vision. So I think I have some ideas for kind of general strategies for creative people. Like if you want to be kind of potentially engaged with dangerous technologies. Uh, <laughs> so I've been thinking about computer vision and faces for about 15 years, and I helped invent face swapping uh, 12 years ago with artist and engineer Arturo Castro. Um, in our everyday life, face analysis feels mostly benign, right? It helps us unlock our phone, and it makes, you know, gives us cute photo filters. <laughs> um, actually, I just want to share this one because I really love this video. <laughs> This is like my favorite face swap <laughs> <laughs> video ever. Uh, but face analysis algorithms, they are dangerous. You know, any tool that attempts to predict an identity or orientation from a face for the purpose of deploying systems that make large scale automated judgments, like that's a dangerous thing. Uh, and you know, for example, this infamous research from Koshinsky where they trained this neural network to predict sexual orientation from a picture of a face. So they used profile photos from a dating website. They combined that with data about the profile's gender and the gender of the person that they were seeking. And then they found that the model worked really well in the context of the data that they had. Um, and then they used that result to make really questionable connections between sexual orientation and biological factors like testosterone levels. Other researchers are attempting to predict whether someone is a criminal based on their appearance. Um, one of these rows is criminal faces and the other is non-criminal faces. So who thinks the top row is criminal faces? Okay, who thinks the bottom row is criminal faces? Oh wow, it's pretty clearly the top row. So it turns out the top is criminal <laughs> uh, and the bottom is non-criminal. <laughs> but I've asked different crowds this question and um, it's not really consistent. Different people <laughs> have different ideas. Uh, it seems kind of funny to me that the non-criminals have a kind of gray background and the criminals have like a more white background. So I guess if you just really wear like a really big gray hoodie, then you're okay. <laughs> Other researchers have been rating you know, how attractive someone is based on their appearance. And for me, this really hammers what's wrong with this situation. You know, we're all really good at kind of making snap judgments at each other about how attractive we think other people look, right? And we often agree with each other. Oh yeah, that person is or isn't 
so attractive, right? Uh, but I don't think this is necessarily like a good feature of humanity. I don't want to bake this into an AI just because estimating attractiveness could be described as a behavior that requires intelligence. That doesn't mean we should just go ahead and automate it. We should spend a little time thinking about what parts of our humanity we actually want to automate. Some of these papers are more speculative and others are aimed at real immediate utility. So this paper claims to predict whether someone is Uyghur, uh, which right now the Chinese state is actively deploying surveillance of Uyghur people in Xinjiang and uh, detaining over one million Uyghur people in re-education camps. Uh, so what do we do? Do we just go out and protest until we get policies changed and legislation passed? Well, maybe, but just hope that the cops aren't deploying anti-disguise face recognition and hope that they aren't flying drones with violent individual identification. <laughs> I, I want to propose uh, four alternative strategies for responding to potentially dangerous machine learning technology. So first, uh, maybe you can find something genuinely useful, even if it's a dangerous technology. And we should explore and encourage those uses. So um, one example is I've been working with the Studio for Creative Inquiry uh, to analyze the work of Tini Harris, who's a newspaper photographer from Pittsburgh. He, he documented his community from the 30s through the 70s in Pittsburgh, and the Carnegie Museum of Art has called his 70,000 photo collection one of the most detailed and intimate records of the black urban experience known today. So I helped analyze and sort these photos in a way that was kind of like intuitive and playful for people who are newcomers so that they could explore it easily, and really helpful for curators and archivists who are working with his images. He didn't keep notes uh, about his photographs, so there's a lot of questions that are left. And one of our main efforts was helping archivists identify who is actually in these photos, because a lot of these people are still living or have you know, still living relatives. And cross-referencing hundreds of thousands of faces is actually best accomplished with automatic face recognition. That's a really good starting point for answering some of those questions. Uh, and actually working with face recognition in this way can feel really healing and refreshing to know that there are applications of this technology in the cultural heritage space, for example, where it is a genuinely useful tool for accomplishing things that we've been trying to do in a much harder, slower, more complicated way for a long time. Um, we also explored a lot of different interface ideas for presenting these collections in intuitive ways. And this work is now accessible to the public at the Carnegie Muse Museum of Art. So you can, if you visit Pittsburgh, stop by the museum and you can kind of go in and explore Tini Harris's archive and all the different people that are in there and the uh, stories that are kind of um, collected through that archive. Okay, another strategy uh, is to just manifest the future so we can kind of collectively gain some experience in the present. This is an installation called Vibe Check uh, that I built with my frequent collaborator, Lauren Lee McCarthy, and we deployed 10 cameras throughout a space, like a gallery or a museum, and then we track how people feel in that space based on their facial expressions, and then we guess who it is in the space that is making them feel that way by tracking who they're spending time with. And then we display those people on a leaderboard. <laughs> we say, this person makes us feel surprised, or this person makes us feel sad. <laughs> and uh, a lot of, yeah. <laughs> so we imagine this world where, you know, maybe what would happen like in the real world if we did the same kind of community policing that we do online, for example. Uh, and maybe if we actually build this out, with you know, real face recognition, real face expression analysis, we can give the audience a chance to build an intuition about what it feels like to live in that world, whether we want it or not, uh, how terrible it feels, or how you know, interesting there are certain parts of it, but kind of like in a safe space, where once you leave the gallery, you know you are not going to run into that again. <laughs> uh, and Lauren and I really like to build you know, real versions of these experiences, uh, not just speculation, but you know, to really like, uh, build out everything the same way that we would if we were a startup or a tech company. Um, and it really helps us build insight about the challenges of building those kinds of systems, and it better informs our perspective on how to effectively critique them. 
Okay, a third strategy, which is to just invert the power dynamic. So this is Ice Spy, which is uh, it's a website I built that <laughs> runs face recognition across the U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement employees. <laughs> I wanted to respond to claims that Microsoft had been providing face recognition software to this U.S. government agency, um, which has repeatedly been shown to violently abuse its power. Uh, so I used a database of headshots that were scraped from LinkedIn, uh, of people who work for ICE. And then I also used Microsoft's own face recognition API uh, to help you find the identity of ICE employees. And it also demonstrates, you know, when you take a picture of yourself, presumably you're not an ICE employee, and uh, it shows you the fascinating ways that tech can fail. And strangely enough, after five years online, um, as of this last month, Microsoft finally disabled small-scale public access to their face recognition services, and the website doesn't work anymore. But it worked for five years. Uh, now they only provide face recognition to really big companies. <laughs> okay, a fourth strategy is to just kind of democratize the means of resistance. I, I spy was kind of fun, and it was cathartic for me to feel like I could do something that was like a bit, a bit of a thorn in their side when I was feeling really frustrated with kind of my own inability to have any impact on you know, that level of governance. And, uh, but it sort of falls into this old trope of like the singular media artist as activist who's like pushing it back against the powers that be. And ultimately, like it's pretty historically clear that you know, any individual act of pushing back in that way is ultimately just gonna be co-opted and turned into like a better defense system by those powers that be. Uh, so as an individual creative person, I don't really think that you can invent something simple that like fundamentally disrupts power. I, I'm just, I mean, maybe there's something, maybe I'm just not creative enough yet. I mean, Signal's pretty good, but <laughs> it's not really, doesn't really work that way. They're eventually gonna find a way to like flip it upside down and turn it into like a funny face filter. Um, <laughs> but I do see hope in the possibility of like spreading resistance more broadly, like across everybody. Um, and so this project, Facework, is a game that basically gives players a chance to interrogate face analysis algorithms in real time and to build intuition that we wouldn't have otherwise because typically when a surveillance system makes a judgment about you, it's doing this behind the scenes. You never get to th see its kind of thought process or you know, respond to it or uh, have a feeling for what it's doing. Uh, you don't get to engage with it in real time. And it's only when you can make an uh, immediate real-time relationship with these algorithms, that's when you can actually build the intuition for them. So I built a face attribute classification system from the ground up uh, using popular face analysis algorithms and data sets. And I basically, I asked the players to just kind of fool with it in real time. Um, and I'm just gonna show you quickly. Let's see if I've got anything scary here. Okay, I'm just gonna show you what this looks like. So we start and it says, okay, get started with your first job. It's a food delivery. So we need you to smile. This is kind of like a future gig economy. You've gotta, you know, make sure that you can play the part. So I come in here and I'm like, you know, okay, all right, all right. Oh, oh God, I gotta smile. Uh, uh. Did I get 95? Yeah, there we go. Hold it, hold it. Okay, all right, great. Whew, it says friendly dinner, uh, fun, friendly delivery. Their smile was the perfect appetizer. Face work took a dollar twenty-five fee, so I didn't get my whole tip, but uh, I got a buck, so I'm happy. All right, let's see what other jobs we've got here. Now we've got uh, wearing mask. We could be um, a babysitter and keep our eyes open. Uh, we have to uh, do dental training, keep our mouth wide open. Um, wearing lipstick, we can be a prank companion. Let's do the mask one and see if we can get away with that. So already it thinks I'm kind of wearing something. Maybe I can do this. There we go, that's a mask. <laughs> 
Really nice mask there. All right, solid. All right. We have been absolutely overwhelmed in the ER, and a couple extra hands always help. This face worker came prepared. <laughs> so you basically just go through these jobs and start to realize, like, wow, this stuff does not work. <laughs> like, I ran this algorithm on the data set that the researchers use, and I used the model that they use, and I got the same, oh, and then it gets interesting. I'm not going to give it away. <laughs> Um, I got the same results that they got. I have like a high accuracy on the data set, right? But once you have literally 10 seconds to interrogate any of these in real time, you're like, this does not work at all. I can just put my hand over my face and it thinks it's a mask. Um, yeah, I, I think that strategy, maybe I'm getting more excited about that, of just letting everyone kind of come in and be like, wow, this doesn't work and I know how to break it. <laughs> OK, stepping away from face analysis, let's finish with a couple questions that I think AI can help us ask. Uh, I want to look at some kind of broader questions. So uh, this is another project with Lauren Lee McCarthy uh, called Unlearning Language. And we used AI to help us ask the question, what does it mean to be human? Unlearning Language is both an interactive installation and a performance uh, that uses machine learning to kind of provoke us to find new understandings of language that are undetectable to algorithms. The piece begins with this one act play for four performers. Uh, each performer who is kind of taking the role of one piece of a future AI. And they ask the audience, you know, what does it mean to be human? And they reminisce about the days past when they were unable to understand humans. You know, before we started changing our voices and gestures, you know, modifying our accent when we speak to Siri so that Siri understands us correctly, holding our phone in just the right way so that uh, our phone can, can uh, make sense of our gestures and voice. Um, they're kind of like longing for the uninterpretable, the, the thing that is so different from what they are now. And they ask us for, to perform for them in a way that they would never understand. Um, that's the beginning of the piece. And then uh, once the performance is over, uh, the audience is basically invited to sign up for some time inside this installation. And they takes uh, groups of up to eight people, and the room kind of acts as the AI. So it guides the visitors through all these questions and kind of encourages them. And they get feedback from vibrating devices in their seats and from flashing lights and from speakers. And their faces are analyzed for facial expressions. Their body language is analyzed for common gestures. Uh, and their speech is recognized. All, we're basically running like everything that we know how to do to understand people. We run all of it. And if we understand it, if the AI understands it, we'll tell them, no, 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 like, I understand that. Try something else, you know? Try and communicate some other way. And by the end of the experience, people are, like, on their chairs upside down. <laughs> and they're, like, quacking at each other in order to answer questions. Um, this was also the first time that Lauren and I used uh, the GPT-3 API from OpenAI in an installation. And this was a few months before ChatGPT came out. And we could kind of feel the strangeness for the first time of having our feet kind of like in both worlds, like looking back from this imaginary future uh, while also like barely stepping into this real future that felt like everything was just about to change. And we're pushing some of these ideas from unlearning language in the next piece that we're about to show at the IDFA Doc Lab in about a month in Amsterdam for a piece called Voice in My Head. Uh, and we're asking, we're using the AI to ask, can we become a new person by giving up control? Voice in My Head, it's essentially a replacement for your internal monologue. So as the visitor, you wear a single AirPod and after your short onboarding session uh, where it asks you, you know, what do you wish the voice in your head sounded like? It instantly clones your voice, and it starts listening to all your conversations. And then once a minute, it starts providing feedback on the conversation with exactly the tone that you asked for in your voice. <laughs> and it's a really strange experience, and I can't wait for some folks in Amsterdam to, ex to see it. Uh, we were asking some kind of similar questions using a simpler AI in an earlier work called People Keeper, where we explored the possibility of machine intelligence controlling every aspect of your social life. We only have so much emotional bandwidth Bring it in. and limited time. What's the best of all? Our social circles are widening. We don't know that's bad. All those relationships. So, like, <laughs> 
overwhelming. Now, there's an app. People Keeper tracks your physical and emotional response while you're hanging out, and it analyzes the data to identify who stresses you out and makes you excited, sad, or happy. See how your relationships stack up, and let People Keeper find the ones that work for you. It'll automatically manage your relationships, so you don't have to. Scheduling time with people that make you feel good, and blocking the ones that don't. Forget fake friends, failed romance, and FOMO. Optimize your social life with People Keeper. <laughs> so this was a real app. Like you could download it, you could get the, you know, you could run it by itself, or you could pair it with the band, which tracked your heart rate variability and stress levels. And uh, it really did just take over and start sending people messages and organizing dates and things. And uh, from the Apple, uh, from the App Store. I think a few thousand people actually tried it. <laughs> yeah, uh, I've been also been asking this question about giving up control with this earlier piece called uh, Blind Self-Portrait with Matt Metz. Um, so the visitor sits down, they hold pen to paper, and when they close their eyes, the machine starts drawing using the visitor's own hand. And you, as the human kind of in the loop, your role is completely minimized. You're just a tool in a larger apparatus that is controlling you. And when I talk to people who are afraid about like some future artificial superintelligence, I really, I always come back to this piece and I think about how it feels when your eyes are closed and your hands getting moved around. And I remember that there's this kind of calm, reassuring quality to it. It's like a, you know, massage or like you're being guided in a way that's really comforting. You don't have to make any more decisions. Everything's going to be okay. You know, you're part of a system and uh, you don't have to work, but work is still getting done. Uh, but there's also this really disturbing quality, obviously, where you constantly feel like you want to break away and assert your free will and take control again. And I think when we worry about this like future, a lot of with AI, uh, a lot of what we're worrying about is kind of power and uh, free will, self-determination, our own intentionality, our ability to like, our, our desire to want to be less and be more at the same time. And uh, I, don't, I don't know where it's going yet. <laughs> I want to finish with one last question, which is, when is human authorship essential? So I've been asking myself this for years in the context of music and AI, because every time a new generative musical tool comes out, it gets closer to generating the kind of music that's been most meaningful to me. You know, I'll type something in there that I hope will sound like you know, my favorite artist growing up, for example, uh, and it'll, I'll get the result out and it will be closer and closer. And I start to wonder like, well, uh, if I heard any of the songs that I love the most, but they were generated by an AI, would I still love them the same way? Or does there need to be a real person behind it for me to connect with? Um, and recently I realized I've just been thinking about this question all completely the wrong way. Um, some of the primary users, like I s mentioned at the beginning of the talk, some of the primary users of generative AI are people who have some kind of creative vision, but they don't have the skills for producing culturally legible work. You know, they can maybe they can describe the image that they want with words, or they can make a rough sketch, uh, or they know it when they see it, but they don't have the kind of experience to produce it from scratch. And in the context of music, I, that's me, basically. Like, I haven't been through the extensive practice that would allow me to easily compose the kind of piano music, for example, that I love the most. So I found this old model built by Google in 2018 called Music Transformer, which has sort it's sort of unloved. Like, they never really released it in a way that has an easy interface. So it took me like four days just to get it to run on my computer. Um, but once I got it to run, it just started spitting out tons of music. And uh, it's a lot like um, GPT-3, but for piano. So it can be initialized with like a short snippet, and it will continue to improvise a whole song. Or you can just ask it to generate something completely new randomly from scratch without any input. And well, so I wanted to write. Uh, a short piano piece for my partner, Olive Komodo. Uh, so I asked Music Transformer to generate thousands of compositions. And then I sorted and like filtered and listened to a bunch of them until eventually I found one that I 
transcribed and kind of modified and developed until it was what I wanted. So I want to play a snippet of a quick recording that Olive made uh, playing her interpretation of this piece. One of the things I learned using Music Transformer and working on this song with Olive, and it's really obvious in retrospect, but the meaning of the work is not tied to how it was generated. The meaning comes from who cares about it. I think from us working together on this, I realized that's where the meaning came from. It doesn't matter that probably 90% of this came from an AI built by Google because the meaning happened when we worked on it together. Um, in closing, I just uh, I hope you can walk away from this presentation knowing that Art Hot has a lot more to offer beyond the automation of skilled creative labor provided by generative tools. Um, but even there, we have a reason to be optimistic about the way that they can create a fulfilling cultural legibility for people who are creative but inexperienced. Thank you, Vel. Thanks. <laughs> So, yeah, nice. So we'll take a few questions, um, if you have for Kyle. Um, so yeah, come on, back up. <laughs> any, any questions? I have one. Yeah. So um, how do you um, define artist in this context? Mm. I, that's a great question, because uh, the thing is being an artist overlaps with so many other things. You know, I am solving technical challenges, sometimes in the same way engineers do. Uh, I am uh, sometimes doing design to like make something work in a way that is, let's say, pleasing or accessible or you know, solving those other kind of uh, design problems. Um, I think the thing that separates being an artist for me mm -hmm. from a lot of that other stuff is it's about the question asking. Hmm. It's about like presenting questions to people, and especially, I mean, you heard me say it a bunch, but building intuition. Uh, I think having an experience that helps you gain some kind of uh, direct knowledge of something that doesn't come from, you know, journalists telling you, here's how things work. It doesn't come from a scientist telling you, here's what I measured. Uh, it comes from you having a direct experience that helps you either connect with someone else or with yourself. That's the art part for me. And it does overlap a lot with design, but um, I think, you know, the <laughs> I think uh, it's reductive, but I tend to think, as the artist says, maybe if the designers are maybe solving problems, the artists are creating problems. <laughs> <laughs> That's one way I think about it, yeah. yeah. Any questions? So um, it seems like a lot of your work is <clears throat> um, playing with data. Mm. And um, it seemed like, in, especially in the, the piece um, with the whale mm. songs, you were, there was a kind of embodied mm. um, data visualization, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, any thoughts about that? Yeah. I, I mean, what's visualization good for? I guess mm. it's good for... Um, helping you get closer to the thing that's being visualized. And uh, I, in the context of the natural world, when it comes to Ampax, for example, um, I guess I've just been learning that it's hard to get abstractly closer. You have to get closer with your body, and mm -hmm. like you have to feel it. Um, it. You can, like, I don't know. On that project, we worked with someone uh, who had previously helped release this album in the 70s called Songs of the Humpback Whale, right. um, Katie Payne. And uh, she basically went to the Caribbean and worked with a Navy engineer to release um, you know, a full LP 
of humpback songs, and it was really the first time that um, the public kind of became broadly aware that humpbacks sing songs. It wasn't, I mean, I don't, maybe, you, maybe you remember, I don't know, but it, no, people didn't know that humpbacks sang songs at some point in the 70s before this album came out. Um, there was just maybe some fishermen and you know, some indigenous people who were aware. Uh, and at that moment, you know, the humpback population was at 10% of its pre-whaling population. It had been completely decimated yeah. due to uh, overhunting. Uh, and after that album came out, it was literally like one decade, two decades, until a bunch of UN policies uh, kind of got adopted by a number of nations. And today, humpbacks are back at 90% of their pre-whaling mm -hmm. population, it was like a few decade turnaround on something that was really about to be the end of humpbacks. And it was literally just the sound. Every, the sound. It was like people feeling it in their body yeah. and being like, oh my God, I, re I feel that, I relate to that. Mm -hmm. So I think that certain kinds of change don't really happen unless we feel it. Mm. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Ask again, yes, a question here. I have a question about maybe how you, it has a bit to do with the copyright uh, thing. I guess that the more your career advanced, more of your work is also in databases somehow. And how do you feel, for example, that maybe some of the face swap images are now in a database that might train a new uh, algorithm and kind of that loop, how it's, if you go on with your work, that might happen for the coming like 10, 20 years. Uh, yeah, it's not really a question, but perspective. Thanks for that question. Um, <clears throat> I don't wanna say I'm not interested in copyright, but I'm more interested in artists and our sustainability, our economic viability, our like lived, lived experience. Um, I think copyright has been a tool to kind of help artists and creative people for a long time but I don't know that it's the best or the right tool, and it seems like it's really obvious now that it's creating some complex problems where uh, it's not being respected in the way that it should, and uh, <laughs> like in places like Japan, uh, they're, they're literally legally allowed to build these models without breaking copyright. Uh, like you can build a big image generator model in Japan and it's completely illegal, it doesn't break copyright. Uh, that's, that's not gonna work for artists long term, especially for anybody who is like, you know, their livelihood as an illustrator or a graphic designer is threatened by automation of these practices. So um, as concerning and complex and interesting as copyright is, I would much rather focus on like, how do we make sure that artists can survive? Uh, how can we make sure designers survive? Um, how do we build up economic infrastructure that allows that to happen? And I don't know if it's going to come from, you know, some people have proposed things like uh, opt-in or opt-out models, or maybe if you make an NFT of the thing, then you get a certain amount of royalties every time it like gets used indirectly. And I don't know if any of that stuff will work. It's too, uh, uh, um, I, I can't see like a legal precedent for that happening. So I would love to step back a little bit and I wanna see more people figure out policy around, you know, like getting more public funding to artists, getting more public funding to designers and increasing that at the same rate that generative models are taking off. Something like that feels more right to me. Yeah, thank you. Peter. Get, we get a mic back here. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Carl. Thanks. I uh, really enjoyed the talk. Thank you. Uh, very interesting. I noticed that pretty much every project is a collaboration with someone. I wondered, um, well, two things. I wondered if you could just describe your collaboration process, what, how that happens, and you know the actual dialogue that you go through with someone and, and what the humans give you that AIs don't? <laughs> I love that question. Um, I think people who don't tell you that projects are collaborations are probably lying. <laughs> uh, I think pretty much every project, some kind of collaboration, you know, you don't, not everyone cites all of their influences and everyone who helped them make something. Uh, you know, I put like, even, I, I do that sometimes too, you know, I showed face work here and I didn't show anybody else, but there were three other people I was working with. It was just that I had the final say on what was and wasn't made because I was the one that got funding to do it. Um, I. 
I think one of the reasons a lot of my work has been collaborative is connected to the way that uh, arts funding works, and um, you know, the it, <laughs> it's a lot easier to get multiple people to have equal say in something than it is to have one person and then hire other people because you cannot pay people enough to do whatever you want them to do from arts funding. Um, you all have to have some say in it. Uh, for me. I also just love that process. You know, I, I got into media art through uh, the open source uh, software scene, through open frameworks and processing. Um, I was really exposed the first time at Ars Electronica to like kind of the broader um, community of media artists. And I just saw everyone working naturally with each other all the time, people sharing their expertise. Um, it wasn't something that I actively thought about doing. It just was the way that it worked. And now I can see like, oh yeah, you're right. Everyone is a collaboration. Um, but yeah, I think that just happens pretty naturally for me. I like to, um, I think that's where new ideas come from and that's where some of the most interesting work comes from is when you have lots of different uh, influences. Um, yeah, what was, the, what was the second half of the question again? What do humans give you that AI what is, doesn't? Yeah, <laughs> they have a perspective, <laughs> you know? I, if you ask ChatGPT a question, it doesn't have a perspective. It has a, a kind of homogenous, homogenized representation of the collective conscious, right? Uh, you can ask it to have a perspective, but then it's just your perspective you've asked it to have. <laughs> uh, you can't, it's not really something you can break or like figure out. Uh, you can't even tell it, come up with a perspective and do that thing, because it will tell you what its perspective is, and now the kind of curtain has been lost. And I think the thing that humans give me is the, impossibility of ever truly knowing someone else deeply, you know? And with ChatGPT, we know it. It's just everything. Like, we already know that about it. So I, I'm interested in working with people that I will never really understand. Other questions? Dirk. So we're a design school and an engineering school, and uh, you've got this great background across engineering and <laughs> arts and design. Um, thinking about the future of design education, you know, I'm curious how you think the arts or art practice might infuse design education. Is there anything you'd like to see or anything that you think would be useful in mm. engineering school? design education? Mm. I don't know that I can have a great answer for that. I taught at uh, NYU for six years at ITP, and I have my own experience of like what worked in that context, but it was a very specific environment. Um, and I can say what worked for me there was basically lots of hands-on stuff, lots of discussion, um, and really like getting students to get deep and like get their hands messy with stuff instead of taking this kind of superficial like we're going to you know only read and reflect on things which is important for other you know applications but i think if you're trying to do this really cross disciplinary thing you have to get your hands messy so yeah, that's my biggest suggestion. <laughs> Figure out how to write code uh, and get everyone to be banging their head against their computer with each other. Yeah. <laughs> I think there's another question uh, here. Uh, hi, thank you for the great presentation. <laughs> really enjoy it. Thank you. Uh, my question is more about the facial recognition mm. one. Uh, are there any kind of policy in place? let's say, to prevent this kind of thing to be used, let's say, in a uh, recruitment process. Let's say because uh, you can cluster uh, types of face that's really good for sales. Yeah. Because it's, it's much easier to quantify face than uh, charisma, right? And uh, businesses are looking for minimizing cost and maximizing a certainty. That, uh, it might lead to uh, discriminatory discriminatory uh, hiring practice yeah. like for sales actor or actress, news anchor? Are there any kind of uh, policies that are already in place? for? That's a great question. Thank you for that. Um, <laughs> and it's a really complicated answer because the, the basic answer is yes, but it varies drastically from you know jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So 
Uh, within the EU, there are a lot more protections than throughout the US, uh, but within the US, you have certain regions, like certain states, that have laws against collecting certain kind of biometric data, and then you have other regions that have laws against using that biometric data to make certain kinds of judgments, like you just said. Um, there's nothing that anyone's agreed on yet, and most places are pretty unprotected for many of those kinds of abuses. Um, two people that would be interesting to look into who have done more artwork about this and thought more about the policy side is Paulo Chirio and Adam Harvey. Um, and they've both gotten really deep into, you know, what the different policies are, where, and how we can kind of change them most effectively. Um, but I'll say just from the face analysis research I've done, two examples that have been most disturbing to me. Uh, one is I found, uh, I almost put it in here, but I found a paper recently that was uh, done by researchers for a uh, consulting for an insurance company where the insurance company is not technically allowed to change their um, rates based on your um, kind of health reports, but they built a model that predicts how obese you are from a photo. Mm. And technically, that is okay. <laughs> so... <laughs> What's even more disturbing is the data set they used for predicting how obese you are is based on a data set of about 20,000 inmates in a Florida jail that they got headshots from. And apparently that's okay because the Florida jail sold the data to them. Yeah, there's, this is just normal stuff in the face analysis world. It's just happening right now. And especially in the US, it's not nice. Um, there's, there's another example I was going to give of... Uh, uh, Actually, let's just leave it there. It's, sorry, it just <laughs> got me off track. But yeah, there's a lot of examples like that. And you should look into like specific jurisdiction that you're concerned about and like what step can be used to kind of move forward a little bit. Take one more question. Stefan? In relation to what you just said, do you see a cultural difference, how your work is being received in the US versus Europe or elsewhere? 100%, yes. In Europe, people can really easily look at this and say, oh my god, that's so dystopian. What an interesting critical artwork. In the US, I very often get the question, so do you think you're going to like develop that further into a startup? <laughs> <laughs> or that would work really well on Shark Tank. <laughs> um, well, actually, this this one, uh, I forget the, if where it was exactly, but this one, People Keeper, we got invited to Shark Tank for this. <laughs> we got halfway through the process, and then they realized at some point, wait a second. <laughs> so yes, a huge difference. Um, and I don't know what fixes that. I mean, so much of this is so deeply tongue in cheek in the way that it's critical. And uh, I don't know if you can yeah, I don't know if you can overcome the kind of tech solutionism that exists in the States. Thank you, and thank you for having me. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. thanks it. so much for coming. <laughs> thanks. Kyle, do you want to take your computer? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs>